Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the American Civil War Museum. Uh, my name is Stephanie Arduini. I'm the Director of Education here at the museum and want to welcome you to our July Foundry Series program called Refugees from Slavery. And tonight we're really excited to explore the connections past and present between refugee experiences, those uh, experienced by by people during the Civil War, particularly African American people who were in contraband camps around the Union military, and refugee experiences that were that people and our neighbors are experiencing here in 2017. So, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Chandra Manning. So Chandra Manning is a professor of history at Georgetown University. She has also served as special advisor to the Dean of Radcliffe Institute at Georgetown University and has taught at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. Her first book, What This Cruel War Was Over, Soldiers, Slavery, and the Civil War, won the Avery O. Craven Prize given by the Organization of American Historians and was an honorable mention for the 2008 Lincoln Prize. Her most recent book, Troubled Refuge, Struggling for Freedom in the Civil War, is about Civil War contraband camps and provides the foundation for our talk this evening. So without any further ado, please help me welcome our speaker tonight, Dr. Chandra Manning. First of all, thanks very much to Stephanie, to Sean, to everybody at the American Civil War Museum um, and the partners who made this evening possible. Thanks to all of you for coming out to it. Um, and I'm really delighted to be here to, to draw connections that are implicit in my work, um, to really bring them from the implicit out to the explicit. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that, and I'm really looking forward to what you and our partners have to say. So I'm, I hope you will enjoy this as much as I will. But I'd like to start this evening by setting a scene and asking you to use your imagination to picture it. So I'd like you to picture columns of smoke rising along a river's edge as terrified children cling to the legs of women clutching a frying pan or a tattered basket or sometimes nothing at all. I'd like you to picture someone finding an old rowboat and people climbing aboard maybe two or three at a time and sailing that rowboat to a sandbar in the middle of the river. I'd like you to picture them gathering armloads of driftwood and stacking those sticks and those twigs into sort of improvised lean-tos, and then huddling under those makeshift shelters until the besieged city across the river finally falls. And then imagine them making their way into that ruined city. They're looking for safety, and they're looking for opportunities to work for the occupying force. Some of them will find both those things. But others, especially at first, will find only crumbling buildings without much to offer, except for a place to die. Still others will find their way out of that city to nearby encampments elsewhere on the river. But everybody in this scenario found were refugee camps. They found those camps not in Dadaab in Kenya or Zatari in Jordan. They found those camps in and around Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1863. Over the course of the Civil War, about half a million men, women, and children fled slavery and took refuge with the Union Army in camps called contraband camps, which sprang up wherever the Union Army infiltrated the Confederacy. Contraband camps and the people in them tell us that emancipation in the U.S. Civil War was, among other things, a refugee crisis. Refugees, in other words, were at the very epicenter of the single most pivotal episode in U.S. history. Refugees, refugees are not marginal to the story of the United States. They are at the very center of it. And if we understand Civil War emancipation as a refugee crisis, there are a number of things I think we see more clearly about the past and about the present. There are five in particular things I think we see more clearly that I'd like to talk with you about tonight. One thing I think we see better are conditions in contraband camps. We understand what those places were like in a much more visceral way. Secondly, 
we also, when we think about these two experiences together, I think we remember to stay attuned to the individual variety in experience. Third, I think we have a keener appreciation of how statelessness left refugees from slavery vulnerable to particular dangers that we overlook sometimes. Fourth, we understand that the courage to flee began, just as it still begins, with an individual refugee. But when it comes to how each individual's story turns out, the response that a refugee met in a camp or from a government or from a society makes a world and made a world of difference. Now the response made a difference to the refugee most obviously, but the response also made a difference to host institutions or governments or societies, which brings me to the fifth point that I think we see more clearly when we think of emancipation as a refugee crisis. In the case of the United States Civil War, providing refuge helped the Union Army win the war, preserve the United States government, end slavery, and redefine what citizenship meant for every person in the United States. Now, those are the five things I want to convince you of over the course of tonight, but let's take them one by one. And to begin with, let's start with this crazy name, Contraband Camps, which sounds a little strange, so I'll tell you where that name came from. On the night of May 23rd in 1861, three men, Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Townsend, ran to, ran to a U.S. Army installation at Fort Monroe in Virginia. That Fort Monroe was commanded by Union Army General Benjamin Butler. The Confederate colonel who owned those three men planned to put them to work building Confederate, uh, Confederate fortifications and to be shipping them south away from their families. For those men, that prospect of separation was the final straw. They ran to the U.S. Army. Next morning, their owner sent an agent to Butler to demand the return of his property as required by the Federal Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Butler refused. For one thing, he pointed out that once somebody, such as the colonel, took up arms in rebellion against the government of the United States, he forfeited his right to ask that same government to enforce a particular law of his choosing on his behalf. But furthermore, Butler continued, the rules of war gave him authority to confiscate an enemy's assets as contraband of war. And Confederates had been nothing if not insistent that slaves were their own assets to do with what they would to do with what they pleased and not subject to anyone else's authority. So what Butler did was use slave owners' own insistence that slaves were property to release three men from their owner's grasp. That term, contraband, stuck. And as slaves flocked to Union Army encampments, the camps that sprung up to house these refugees became known as contraband camps. It's 1861 slang. It's sort of hit the lexicon and people ran with it. But don't let the weird name fool you. The camps were, without question, refugee camps. And the half million men, women, and children who lived in them during the Civil War lived through a refugee crisis. Contraband camps existed everywhere the Union went because slaves ran to the Union Army everywhere it went. In the eastern theater of the war, camps clustered in and around the capital region, so Alexandria, Virginia, Arlington, Virginia, they clustered along the coastal region of Virginia. Fort Monroe never left the Union Army. And camps soon also dotted the coasts of North Carolina, South Carolina, and the very northern part of Florida as far as Jacksonville. Uh, camps sprung up in those places just as soon as Union naval and army forces captured those lands. In the East, once a camp was established, it was likely to stay put for the duration of the war because in those coastal locations, once the Union army controlled territory, it tended to hold it for the war. So I often say that to understand or to picture in your mind contraband camps in the East, think of a landscape painting. It's big and it's expansive, but everything in it kind of holds still. 
with one exception, and that exception is where you guys are right now. Uh, the swath between Richmond, two exceptions, the swath between Richmond and Washington, D.C., and the Shenandoah Valley. Those two swatches of territory went back and forth between Union and Confederate forces many times. So camps in those two parts of Virginia were more transient. There was more overturn, because if the Union Army left, the camp had to get out of Dodge. In that sense, the Richmond-Washington Corridor and the Shenandoah Valley were very similar to the Western theater of the Civil War. Because in the Western theater of the Civil War, Union troops were much more mobile. They were on the move all the time, and so camps were too. They tended to track rivers and railroads because that's where Union forces tended to consolidate their energy. Uh, so camps in the West, just as many, but much less stable. Uh, if you want to picture them in your head, you got to sort of give up your idea of a landscape, and instead you need a kaleidoscope. You need to see pieces moving all the time, and that's camps in the West. With this exception, in the West, cities were more stable. The Union did take places like New Orleans and Nashville um, and Memphis and then hold those cities for the duration of the war. So in those cities, large uh, uh, contraband camps got established and stayed established. Cities in Union territory surrounded by Confederate leaning populations. So Cairo, Illinois, which dips way down um, across from uh, slaveholding territory. St. Louis, Missouri, in Missouri, a state slave state that stayed in the Union, those Union held cities surrounded by Confederate leaning territory, large contraband camps est established early and stayed in those cities too. But other than that, if you're in the Mississippi Valley, you are on the move all the time. Wherever the Union Army was, camps sprang up fast with no time for advanced planning. Refugees from slavery typically arrived hungry. And lacking adequate, adequate clothing, they were often in poor health. Now, soldiers' rations could stave off starvation, but they were monotonous. And if you haven't eaten well in several months and your health is run down anyway, then hardtack and rancid bacon isn't really the fare most designed to bring you back up to fighting form. Cast-off uniform pieces could outfit slave refugee men. Union Army had no reason to have on hand large stashes of women and children's clothing. So women and children often had to wrap up in old blankets or cut up army overcoats and wrap up in those until aid parcels from northern aid societies and churches could arrive. And especially once the Union Army began recruiting black men into its forces, up to 80% of contraband camp inhabitants were women and children. So up to 80% um, are without adequate clothing, are without access to adequate clothing, because so many men joined the Army. Housing and fuel shortages were perpetual. Sometimes so many refugees arrived at once that they had to resort to railroad carts Railroad, sorry, railroad cars or outbuildings or sometimes old packing crates. In cities that had had slave markets before the war, sometimes the old slave pens ended up being the only place available if a large group came in at once. Fresh water was a problem almost anywhere. And I will go out on a limb and say, I think it was the biggest problem almost anywhere. Because a camp formed hastily uh, often didn't take the time to think about the best location for keeping water supplies clean. They contaminate quickly. And once your water supply contaminates, you have a health crisis on your hand. But too much water could also cause a problem. The Mississippi River and its tributaries flooded all the time. And when they did, that spread all kinds of new and different waterborne diseases. So sickness and mortality rates were utterly horrific. Now eventually, contraband camps gained hospitals and medical staffs, and they were organized and run exactly the same way Union Army um, hospitals were. So state of the art for the 19th century, but for the 19th century is a pretty big asterisk if you know anything about 19th century healthcare. Um, and even when the system governing contraband camp hospitals was identical to Union Army hospitals, and the system was, there was a war going on, which meant there was always supply and distribution problems. If there's a shortage, who do you think is going to get the good stuff first? The soldiers fighting the war, that's who's going to get the good stuff first. So there are always shortages, and there are always substandard supplies. Now, camps offered opportunities, to be sure. Most Immediately, they offered a path out of slavery, 
and for thousands, they offered a chance at paid employment. Many of the camps also developed schools and a sense of community, a real social um, network could form in camps. And in some places, former slaves established local governments. They elected their own officers, they elected their own police forces, and they began to build social lives. And all of those things are important. And all of those things took a great deal of courage to, um, and ingenuity to craft in wartime. And I don't want to take away from that courage or that ingenuity, but I do want to say that all of those things constantly coexisted with suffering. Conditions, in short, are eerily similar to the conditions you see today if you tune in onto a news broadcast of refugee camps anywhere in the world. Now another similarity with today, I think, is that then as now, there was no such thing as a typical refugee who was just like every other person who was fleeing slavery. Just as today, the individual experience of fleeing oppression and seeking refuge was different for every person and for every family. And if we skip the individual stories and we just focus on the averages and the common trends, I think we don't really understand the experience very well. So I'd like to share a few stories of individual people's experiences with you, not because they were just like everybody else's, but because there were 500,000 different individual stories that made up the contraband camp phenomenon. So one of the stories I'd like to tell you is about a woman from North Carolina who broke out of slavery by putting her children and a basket of eggs into a canoe, holding the side of that canoe and walking it 12 miles up the coast of North Carolina. A basket of eggs. The most fragile thing that I can think of, a basket of eggs in a canoe with her kids, or if there are anything like mine, she would have had nothing but eggshells by about the second mile, if that. But she did it. That's how she got herself and her kids to freedom. She did that. She put those eggs, she put those kids into a canoe with absolutely no idea if she would make it. She could be, re she could be caught. She could be re-enslaved. She could drown. Her children could drown. She could make it to the Union Army and then die of disease. She could lose those kids and any number of ways. So that woman's story isn't typical in any specific way, but it made me understand in a way that I hadn't before, that emancipation was a step into the unknown and that the chances of its failure were immeasurably high. To exit slavery was to go up against hard power and to be filled with fear and to decide to do it anyway, to take one step and then to take another and hope that whatever that day brought you, those eggs or that canoe could be patched together into a route out. That's what emancipation felt like. Now another story that I like that just sticks with me demonstrates how in contraband camps the extraordinary circumstances of living through a refugee crisis, of living through emancipation, of living through a war were always kind of braided with the very everyday experiences of life and that coexistence of the completely quotidian and the extraordinary I think is an important part of the texture of contraband camps. And the guy who really demonstrates that interweaving well for me is a guy named Gaston Becton. Now, Gaston Becton was from North Carolina. Throughout his life, he had hated being a slave. But until 1861, the whole power of the state and the national government was on the side of his owner. So it didn't really matter how much he hated slavery. There's not one thing he could do about it because the risks of rebellion or of running away were just too high. Until 1861 and 1862, because then, the Union Army came to North Carolina and the balance of power tipped. And when that balance tipped, a pathway opened up if Gaston could get on that path. Well, he did get on. He got on that path on a very ordinary day. He at that time was rented out. His owner rented him out to a non-slave holding family who paid the owner for Gaston's labor. And the person he was rented out to, the woman he was rented out to, told him to go pick peas. I don't know what it was about picking peas, but he, that was it for him. He was not going to pick peas. That was the day he was done. So when the, uh, the woman who was renting his labor told him again, pick the peas. 
He took the whip out of her hand and he whirled her around and he lashed her across the back. And as she fell to the ground, he dropped the whip and he ran. And he made it to what was called a mess of Union soldiers. A mess is a smaller group, four or five, typically friends within a regiment or within a company who sort of hang out together and take their meals together. And the mess hired Gaston to cook for them. Paid labor as a cook for this mess of Union soldiers. And that's how he got out of slavery initially. Things were fine until the Union Army changed its regulations. No more messes, all soldiers were to eat together with the company. Couldn't hire out your own cook anymore. Well, now Gaston Becton is out of a job, but the Union Army had started to enlist black soldiers. There was a recruiter. The recruiter asked him, did he think he was about 18? Yeah, he thinks he's about 18. Well, I don't think he was 18. And the reason why I don't think he was 18 was because after he mustered into the Union Army and was issued his uniform, he grew about six inches. He went on a teenage growth spurt. For the rest of the war, his arms and his legs stuck out of his uniform. Now again, there's nothing typical about that experience, but that juxtaposition between the most ordinary thing, a growth spurt, and the extraordinary thing, a former slave fighting in the Union Army after living in a contraband camp. That juxtaposition, to me, tells us something about the experience of living through emancipation as a refugee crisis. There are two more, the juxtaposition of two more individual stories, I think, tells us something about how camps were at the same time places of unspeakable suffering and unimaginable joy at the very same time. One of the stories involves a woman whose name I don't know. And I don't know because it's not recorded. But she was enslaved in South Carolina. And when Sherman's army marched through, she joined them. This band of hardened veterans who had been on the march who were as fit as you could be in the army in 1864 and 1865, she kept up with them. She kept up with them through South Carolina. She kept up with them into North Carolina. And she marched right out of the state of South Carolina and right out of slavery all the way to a beach in North Carolina. And then when she was just yards away from a contraband camp where she might have found refuge, she collapsed from exhaustion. She died alone on a beach with a mouthful of sand as the only taste of freedom she ever got. I like to place her story in my mind next to another story that took place in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, one woman, there are two women involved. One was Susan and one was Mary, and I can't remember. I'll tell you who was who, so I'm going to arbitrarily assign them. But um, there was a woman named Susan, and she had been in a contraband camp in Tennessee that had to be evacuated because Union forces were moving. And um, so she had to get out of there. Maybe she was Mississippi, but she had to move because the camp was going away. So she was packed up along with everybody in that camp, and they were sent to a huge camp contraband camp on an island in the Mississippi River right off the coast of where Memphis is, President's Island it's called. And she gets there and it's overwhelming and it's cacophonous and there are all these voices and there's noise and there's confusion and where are they going to go tonight? Are there enough tents? Are there not enough tents? Who's going to eat what? Are there enough jobs? Confusion everywhere. And all of a sudden she hears a voice. It sounds an awful lot like a voice at least that she hasn't heard in 15 years. It sounds like the voice of her sister Mary. She hasn't seen Mary in 15 years because 15 years ago, Mary and Susan's owner sold Mary. The reason why was because Mary's two sons had been sold away two years previously. And Mary had grieved so hard, mourned so hard, she had depreciated her own work value. She didn't work as hard. She didn't work hard enough anymore because she was just, she, she just wouldn't let these kids go. So to punish her, she was sold. And Susan hadn't seen her since. But she turned around, and that was Mary. And the two of them at first couldn't talk. They were overcome. They could not say a word. And then finally, when they could speak, the first thing Mary told her was, guess who else was in that camp? Those two boys. They were teenagers now. And there's no question that the joy of reunion that that family found in that camp resulted from their own desire to escape and their own courage to run. But that story is the last I know of them. I don't know 
if they stayed together. I have no guarantee that happiness continued for them because no matter how courageous refugees were, their courage and their determination were not always enough to create the outcome that they wanted. War created the opportunity to trade slave status for refugee status, but war also brought danger like firepower and disease and merciless military necessity. Now those are dangers that everybody in a war zone is vulnerable to, but refugees from slavery were even more vulnerable than most, even more vulnerable, for example, than white Southerners who fled war's destruction. And why? Because by the terms of the 19th century United States understanding of things, men, women, and children fleeing slavery were stateless. The antebellum United States Supreme Court had declared that black men, women, and children could not be citizens of the United States. And so refugees from slavery did not have the same clear claim on the protection of the United States government that a citizen did. A citizen did. Refugees without papers were by far the most vulnerable during and after World War II. And in many places of the world, they still are today. That same principle applied in the Civil War as well. They were vulnerable to all the dangers of the war, but they were vulnerable in the Civil War to another very specific danger, and one that we lose sight of, or it's very easy for us to lose sight of. And that's the danger of re-enslavement. Far from being doomed the moment slaves decided to depart their masters, the institution of slavery and its supporters fought back violently. And slavery supporters had every reason to expect they'd win that battle. The Ark of Progress doesn't always go forward. It only goes forward when people remain diligent enough to keep bending it in the direction towards justice. Those who wanted to push it backwards in the 1860s had good reason to expect they would be able to do so. Because in world history up to that point, world history up to the 1860s, wars didn't end slavery. Wars didn't make fewer slaves. Wars expanded slave territory. More slaves, not fewer was usually the result of warfare. So if we remember that emancipation was a refugee crisis and that refugees from slavery were stateless, we see the huge risks that they ran much more clearly. If Confederates recaptured them, they either killed them or re-enslaved them. The freedom that refugees from slavery ran for could only be permanent if three things happened. One, the Union had to win the war. Two, the Union had to destroy the institution that most wars had strengthened, and that is the institution of slavery. And then third, the US government would need to take legal action to change the stateless nature of former slaves. And so when we think about civil war, the Civil War as, or emancipation during the Civil War as a refugee crisis, I think we really get a fresh realization of how remarkable and surprising it is that the U.S. Civil War bucked the norm, at that time at least, that norm of warfare creating more slaves and expanding more territory, and instead the U.S. Civil War did the opposite. It shrunk slave territory, it turned slave territory into free territory, and it abolished the institution of slavery. Now to understand how and why the U.S. did that, we need to look at the response that refugees from slavery met when they made it to refugee camps. What happened when they got there? And that response varied a lot in individual cases. It was to some degree a product of the mood and the inclination of whoever they ran into first. But overall, the response of the Union Army was to build alliances with refugees from slavery because Union soldiers and refugees from slavery needed each other. It is not to say that Union forces always treated freed people well, but both soldiers and former slaves wanted to defeat the Confederacy, and they recognized that they needed each other to do it. Soldiers were far from home. They were in hostile territory that they did not know very well, and they were surrounded by civilians who did not like them very much, to put it politely. So, when hundreds of thousands of escaped slaves ran to Union lines, they brought their labor, their loyalty, and their local intelligence with them. And they put all of that to work for the Union Army. 
quartermaster departments in every single theater of the war, from the Washington, D.C. region to the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, utterly depended on the digging and the ditching and the building and the hauling and the stacking and the crating that black men, women, and children did to keep the Union war machine in motion. Former slaves spied for the Union Army because the kid from Ohio doesn't know that that creek is going to flood and that you shouldn't camp on it. But the former slave who's lived here for 10 years does know that. And we know what else? He knows where Confederates are hiding. He knows who's loyal, who's not. He knows where supplies are. The best spies for the Union Army were, without question, escaped slaves. Former slaves nursed in Union hospitals, and they laundered the linens and the uniforms that kept men healthy enough to fight. And that mattered in a war that would come down to who could keep the most men in the field for the longest time. Former slaves sewed grain sacks, which matters more than you think. Because if you are a 19th century army and you want to move, then you need livestock. You need horses to pull wagons. And they need to eat. And if they're going to eat, then you got to be able to hold their sacks. Or you have to hold their grain or oats or whatever it is they're eating. And there's a burlap shortage on during the Civil War. And I know of at least one case where the quartermaster finds 5,000 sacks, grain sacks, he thought he had that were full of holes. And a whole campaign had to come to a screeching halt because there's no way to feed the horses. But a group of women who had escaped from slavery stitched those stacks up, and the campaign went off after all. By allying with Union forces in these ways, Former slaves struck a bargain. They exchanged their labor and their loyalty for the basic protection of rights. And when they did that, they helped to win the war. By helping to win the war, they helped to end slavery, and they helped to preserve the United States government. By offering their labor and their loyalty to the Union Army in exchange for government protection of at least some of their basic rights, they changed the meaning of US citizenship in three ways that continue to matter. They continue to matter you to you, sitting right here today. Before the war, it was not the federal government that determined eligibility for citizenship. It was the states that did that. During the war, the, uh, the determiner, the sort of eligibility officer shifts. It becomes the federal government. That's who decides you're a citizen now, the US federal government. Before the war, citizenship meant membership within a political community, but it did not necessarily mean protection of rights. Rights protection and citizenship were two different things, not the same thing. By being able to lay claim to the protection of the Union government or the Union army, former slaves in refugee camps linked those two things, rights protection with citizenship, in a way they hadn't been before. And now we do think that citizenship carries within it a degree of rights protection on the part of the government for the individual. We think that because of what happened in refugee camps. And then finally, before the war, this is the obvious one, citizenship in all but a handful of states excluded black people. It was restricted to white people. And after the war, nationwide, citizenship explicitly included African Americans. Now, the reason for these changes was that the white property owners who clearly enjoyed citizenship before the war, but then fought against the United States, had a less clear claim on the protection of the Union Army or the US government than black refugees from slavery who were helping to save that government. So the government had to recognize it had a greater obligation to protect the basic person and the basic rights of someone helping to save the government rather than somebody fighting against the government. Now, even after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, subsequent events, evolving forces, would continue to reshape what citizenship meant, sometimes expanding what we mean by citizenship, sometimes contracting it. And really, if you stop and think, that shouldn't come as a great surprise, because the definition of citizenship could never really be a once and for all kind of task. Defining citizenship, giving citizenship meaning, agreeing on what it means, has always been, and it will remain, a work in progress. Right now, we find ourselves in another moment where civil warfare and oppression are creating large numbers of refugees worldwide. Just yesterday, a federal judge upheld a ban on refugees to the United States. Right now, 
up to 80% of the inhabitants of the world's refugee camps are women and children. Just as the overwhelming majority of the residents, the inhabitants of camps in the 1860s were women and children. Right now, those women and children sicken and die from the lack of clean water in Kenya um, and around the world, just as they did at Vicksburg or at Fort Monroe. Right now, men, women, and children take enormous risks to sail in boats or to dash across hostile landscapes, to get to Jordan or to Turkey or to Greece, much as they took enormous risks to get to the Union Army. But right now, our response is different on an official level. Right now, our response is not alliance. And I don't think it was so much easier in the past. I think a difference between then and now is that the fate of the United States held it in the balance. And so there was some bargaining power that refugees had in the 1860s they don't have today. Another big difference between then and now is that contraband camps or refugee camps before any kind of institutional apparatus to ease suffering had been invented. There's no Red Cross in the 1860s. There's an army. <laughs> Well, armies aren't humanitarian organizations. Armies are armies. Uh, so there really was no organized institutional aid to persons displaced by war, and there wouldn't be into the following century. We do have professional organizations today, but even still, the problems facing refugees are absolutely enormous. And we're fortunate to have representatives from two such organizations here today, and I know after the break, I am really looking forward to hearing from them. But I want to close just by reiterating the basic point that in the 1860s, refugees helped preserve the United States government. They helped to end slavery. And they helped redefine what citizenship meant for everybody. Not once and for all, but part of the ongoing work of defining citizenship, work that continues to be our responsibility today, just as refugees have been and are at the heart of our national experience. Thank you. So for this next portion of the event, because our Foundry Series program really does want to make that bridge between past and present, we're really excited about the conversation in this next part. And in our planning phone calls, the conversation was really, really good. So I'm excited to see what comes out here. Uh, how this is going to work is we will have each of our community partners and members of our panel introduce themselves briefly. Just give you a little bit of a snippet about the work that they do and their perspective, who they are, what their story is. And then we're going to have them start with some questions I know they're wanting to ask each other. From there, as you have questions that come up, feel free to raise your hand and I'll come out and kind of point to you or call on you, if you will. And we'll start opening up that dialogue between our panelists and you all, our audience. And we'll go until we run out of questions or until we hit almost 8 o'clock, whichever comes first. All right. And with that, I'll pass it over. Chandra, I'm going to skip you because we introduced you already. <laughs> so John, I'll give it to you first. I'm John Bauman. I am the director of the Virginia CWS programs. That's Church World Service. Uh, Church World Service is one of the nine uh, State Department approved resettlement agencies. And so we have a large operation overseas focusing on Sub Saharan Africa, helping people sort of get through the process of uh, becoming resettled refugees on the international side. And then we have a network of 34 offices here in the state. So once they make the flight over and have their community here, um, we have them. I'm not sure if I need to adjust this. Um, we have offices that help them resettle here. So briefly, it's sort of everything. In, in our Richmond office, we have an office in Harrisonburg as well. When people get off the plane here in Richmond, we meet them at the airport. There's a hot, culturally appropriate meal that day. We get them to an apartment. Uh, often there are volunteers who help furnish the apartment, sometimes volunteers who continue on uh, to help the family over the coming months. We help with some of the bureaucratic stuff. One needs a Social Security card, Medicaid, food stamps, and so on for the short term. Um, uh, we uh, work with partners to Thank you. 
Uh, we work with partners to help kids get enrolled in school. And um, it's sort of a fast and furious first few months to get people to that first job that's just, just enough that they can pay their rent. And then that's sort of a nice uh, little bit of a plateau. And then after that, we have some other programs where uh, families who have more needs, we can continue on working with them for up to five years. And then some of our partners in the community have other programs that complement ours as well. So, um, so that's uh, uh, kind of a two-minute version of what we do in Richmond and, and Harrisonburg. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Abdul Sattar Mirzi. I am one of uh, Afghan refugees in Richmond. Uh, I have spent like a couple of years with the U.S. Army back home. Uh, I, you know how it's difficult to work with U.S. Army in Afghanistan. It's very hard to work with U.S. Army in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, I can't believe that. <laughs> uh, what kinds of things did you do with the uh, Army? I was a translator with them and a uh, convoy driver. I I spent like very hard times with them. I pray for my friends that uh, they left behind. I pray for my U.S. Army friends that they left behind. Uh, that's very hard to work with the U.S. Army in Afghanistan. So that's the reason that I left my family, my father, mother, everybody behind and came to United States. So I appreciate it from Mr. John that the first time I have seen in the U.S. Army, it was Mr. John Bowen <laughs> in the United States. I never forget this. And I appreciate it from Miss Katie, Mary Virginia, they're not here. Uh, These are church volunteers. Who yeah, now work I'm working with church full services. I'm working with refugees. So pray for all uh, U.S. armies that they are working in Afghanistan because it's very hard. They, they got every day in bushes, RPGs, everything. They're in a very hard life. Like Afghans also, which they are working with U.S. Army. That's very hard. I think. Thank you. I'm Kate Ayers, and I'm the executive director of Reestablish Richmond. And we are a local counterpart to John and Church World Services. We were founded in 2010 by a, by a gentleman named Patrick Brawford, who was working amongst some Burmese uh, refugees who had been here for quite some time. And um, he just saw a need for a community-based organization to support the work that the resettlement agencies do. Um, uh, we'll probably get into this as we discuss um, uh, as we ask questions, but um, it takes a really long time for someone to feel like they have found a new home. Um, sometimes at least five years it takes someone to feel settled and comfortable in a new place. And so we exist to help people um, and walk them towards that process of feeling like they're fully integrated into a new community um, for the longer period of time. We run programs and transportation and community engagement. Um, we also work with John um, to provide um, volunteers and homes to help be an American friend to newcomers um, to Richmond. So thank you for having us here. I do. So uh, uh, I, I would really love to, because I just talked plenty, so I would really love to hear from all of you what you hear as similarities and also as differences between the experiences in the 1860s and the experiences today. One that strikes me is the experience of family reconstitution versus family separation, that often a spur for running is to keep a family together. But from your experience, Abdul, your family is a, has been split apart. Um, that's a whole new sort of level. So the um, separation versus reconstitution might be something that's different from person to person or from then to now, but I'd love to hear from all of you what what similarities you hear and what differences you hear. In the, the idea of separation versus... Well, I mean, that's, that, that's just okay, one. one. That I, 
strikes me as, as a difference. But I would love to hear from all of your perspectives um, if we, for a moment, just assume that what I say about the experiences in the 1860s is right. Um, what of that experience sounds similar to you and what sounds different from what you see in your perspective today? I have an idea. Oh, okay. okay. Um, one of the um, things that I was thinking, and I, I read it in, about it in your book, and um, is um, actually very um, relates to the Afghan community. Um, here in Richmond, about 70% of the refugees who are being resettled in Richmond over the last several years are actually from Afghanistan. And many of them um, are like Abdul and um, served with the US Army. Um, and many of them grew up during the Taliban regime. And um, because of that, um, women weren't allowed to go to school, and I know you could speak more um, personally about this, um, but um, in our programs, we work with a lot of Afghan women, and we provide opportunities for them to do things for the first time, like go to school and learn to drive. And um, I, I've, I've talked to some Afghan women who did say, yes, my mom um, had to hide me in the basement, and that's how I learned to read. And and I'd, I've seen, I've read some some scenarios where that was similar in the slave um, during the the period of the Civil War. That um, the slaves that were lucky enough to be educated, it was because they had parents or uh, slave owners or someone who believed in them and believed it was important enough to do it, even if it had to be undercover. So. The, uh, I know we, we have uh, what, three or four Afghan uh, folks working for us now, which is very useful, just because almost everyone who's coming at the moment is Afghan. Um, but just in hearing uh, some of the conversation, I actually, you know, years and years ago, I did a, a Peace Corps stint on the uh, Burmese border. I was in Thailand. And so I, I think of the Burmese, you, you know, you mentioned Tabernacle, where reestablished, got started out of and the, the Burmese uh, communities there. Um, just knowing about, you know, for example, the story of the Karen Burmese, and, you know, it's been decades of war uh, in Burma, but, um, you know, your, your story about pulling the uh, canoe with the eggs, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, I guess it's hard to imagine being in that situation, but just the sense of um, hopelessness and yet having enough hope uh, to, to cling to that there you are, you are actually pulling the canoe as opposed to, to not. And, you know, I think in Burma, it's just been such turmoil for generations, some of what the, the refugees have gone through, just fleeing villages because the army incursions came and then and ultimately, you know, starting in the 80s, um, coming across and uh, having so many large camps established on the on the Burmese side. So the sort of the, um, you know, the, the balance between hopelessness and, and clinging to some hope in the original situation, and then I think once they get in the camps, it's a very, very small percentage of folks in some of the larger camps in Thailand and, and in Dadaab in Kenya and Zatari camp um, who actually get resettled or get to go back to their home country at least any time soon and some folks are there for years or even decades so you know again there you are maybe your situation isn't uh, as life and death as the situation that you fled but but it's not much of a life there so again it's just sort of what's there to give someone hope um, so I mean that feels like a, a, a parallel I know you, you could probably speak to just some of the, well, like Hamed from our office just finally got his first trip back. He hasn't been back to Afghanistan since he came to the U.S., and this will be the first time that he sees his baby daughter. You know, speaking of split families, so he's probably seeing her for the first time right about now. But can you say a little bit more, as, as Kate was talking about, um, just the difficulties of having some of your family here and some back home? Yeah. Uh, the U.S. Army process it takes like a, a, to get a visa, SIV visa, it takes like a while, like two years, three years, sometime, for somebody 
it takes like four years, five years. Uh, so my mistake only two years only I can came here with my family or kids. No parents, no more. So this is the only difficult things here to stay without parents here. I left everybody behind. Uh, and the first time which we arrived here in the United States, uh, we have been a culture shock here <laughs> because it's difficult. Uh, Afghanistan here completely different, different mind, everything is different. Uh, so now the old problem was solved in this six month. Uh, we're good here, and I wish that one day I can uh, take my parents to the United States and stay with me. I love them. <laughs> Thank you. And just kind of a tech. Technical point, uh, you heard uh, Abdul talk about SIVs. You may know about this or not, or you may read about it in the paper. It's um, actually, uh, I guess for our purposes, we can think of it as a special category of refugee, which is technically not, but, but for our purposes today, um, the U.S. government, in um, recognition of how valuable the support of you know, folks like Abdul in Afghanistan, some of the you know, countrymen there, and in Iraq, um, issues special immigrant visas. So it's a more streamlined process and it, it comes through the refugee resettlements uh, system. The difference between those and sort of the so-called quote unquote regular refugees aren't terribly important today. But if you hear us talk about SIVs, it's sort of the, the folks uh, like Abdul from Afghanistan or Iraq who come. As John was just talking, I was thinking about a parallel that um, you kind of made with this idea of citizenship and this idea of, um, you know, Abdul did help the, the U.S. Army in their efforts. And because of that, we, as a, as a government, decided that we needed to protect him. And so was, it, um, and I, th I believe that that's how the SIV program was born. Um, so I just wanted to point that, that out. That's definitely a, a parallel. Yeah, I mean, uh, the parallel is probably a little better between the folks who are jumping into boats and landing on the shores of Greece, I would think, because they land there and they they um, they basically have no status in the country where they've just landed. It's very chaotic and so on. So, um, and, and and sometimes in the public's mind they think refugee and that's the image they have, but they sort of apply it to our situation. Our situation is not like that at all. I mean, the chaos is sort of overseas for the most part uh, but once you get through sort of the UN application process and all of the screenings the security screenings by four or five different defense and homeland security type agencies the health screenings and so on and become that one percent or less than one percent who actually gets resettled um, then you're good you have a legal status as a refugee and so you've been you know we've talked about vetting for the last year or two you're as vetted as anybody who's ever come into this country. Uh, but you have this legal status, so you're here, and, and so it all uh, uh, you know, just bureaucratically goes fairly smoothly. Um, SIVs come with a green card or get one shortly after getting here, and, and the non-SIV refugees can get a green card or legal permanent resident card after a year. And then, you know, if all goes well, after five years, people can become citizens. But the l refugee status and the green card status, our legal status is uh, here as well. So, so it's, yeah, I think the European situation is, is a, a better parallel probably.
So are you, are you asking Abdul what his sort of desires are first, and then yes. maybe a second your question? Your desires, I mean, you're the yeah. person most directly affected by all of this, but uh, but just in general for the organizations that are, that are helping refugees, uh, uh, what the what, what the long game is, uh, what we, we expect there. Yeah. Um, I think the intent of the refugee resettlement program, which um, kind of starts through the UN and filters all the way through the, the uh, national and local and state offices. So by the time people come here, I think the intent is permanent um, citizenship. So um, we often say that refugees have gone through this process. Part of that process is proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is unsafe for them to return back home. And so um, the, the end game is definitely citizenship. So when people come, they're invited to the United States to stay for a year, get their green card, and then eventually apply, apply for citizenship. Um, I would say, I think you've hit on something that's very true, that when people come, that isn't that's not what their heart wants. Um, maybe that's what their mind um, knows is best for their family. But I don't, you, you could probably speak more to that piece. Yeah, so do you, do you think, like you're here now, and uh, at the risk of oversimplifying, do you think you or most of the Afghan SIVs here um, really think, hey, maybe one day I'll go, go back with my family? Or is everyone thinking, well, I'm, I'm here and this is really where my family's going to be? I may go back and visit, but I'm not going to go back and live. What, what do you think most people in your situation uh, believe? In my opinion, uh I'm not going Afghanistan because I cannot go Afghanistan because already uh, you know war in my country everybody's that they are working with the US army with coalition forces with some uh, companies ISS Taliban know about them so it's hard for me and go there because if I go there they said see now he is American so it's very hard for me and also my family life is in danger in Afghanistan too uh, somebody's they don't think they said okay well never mind I go back to my country so it's hard for them and I'm sure one day he is coming back to the United States those yeah. who have tried to go back yeah you think they're yeah I, back? yeah I know a couple of him that he wants like now like 15 ago they're trying to come back to America because they said no it was wrong way that we went to Afghanistan and they're coming back here because everybody knows about them that his family, everybody, friends, that he wants to America. Now everybody knows he's American. Yeah. I recently just um, saw a Facebook post from a friend of mine. Um, John, you might know them, the, the two family. Um, and they are from Burma, and they arrived here about eight years ago. And um, they, the family has all gotten citizenship, and it's like a family of maybe six or seven individuals, and they all just went back to Burma. And one of them um, came here when she was maybe seven or eight, and now she's a teenager. And she posted on Facebook a picture of her home, um, and because she went back to the refugee camp where she was born and grew most of her life, and then she. Uh, put below it a picture of her home now. Um, and she was one of a fortunate um, family who was able to get a, a Habitat for Humanity house. And so just seeing the, the contrast and just, yeah, um, she was so excited to go back to her home, but this was at eight years. And Burma, it's unlike Afghanistan, Burma is, is you know, found a, a, a state of relative peace depending on where you go. So I think it probably also depends on um, what kind of conflict you are fleeing from. And, and the neat thing about that post was um, because she was young, she was a young child in the camp, it really was obviously, the way she posted it was obviously a very fond memory. So, you know, little kids, it's like, that's your normal and you don't think, how does my house compare? You know, you sort of live in whatever your community is and that's your world view. So I think, you know, it was like going to, like if we had that nostalgic first trip back to our hometown that we hadn't been to in years, so th that was impressive, even though it was a refugee camp, and um, you, you might guess that she'd think, oh, I'm so glad to be out of there. But no, she was little when she was there. <laughs>
yeah, I'll take that question, I, I, but I'll also use it as an opportunity to respond to the previous question a little bit. Embedded in the previous question was the assumption that there were no repercussions to former slaves um, who spent time aiding the Union Army if they went back to where they were before. And actually, that's a very false assumption. Um, there is a wave of violence across the post-war South, and a lot of it is retributive violence, um, aimed at anybody for getting free, but particularly uh, for anybody known to have aided Union forces. That's one reason why troops, U.S. troops stay in the South. Um, and that's one reason why, as they leave, and they leave pretty quickly, or the numbers go down pretty quickly, why violence shoots up um, because there, in fact, was bloody retribution for former slaves who had aided the Union Army. Um, and that leads into your question about, so what happens to all of these people after the war? A number of motivations are pulling the U.S. government in, in different directions, one of which is making emancipation real. And that means finding families, and that means people getting established and resettled. But there are other motivations pulling them in opposite directions. And one of those is to complete the political reunification process as fast as, fast as possible, to get the formerly Confederate states back in the Union as quickly as possible. And there's a sense of, well, we'll let bygones be bygones. That leads to a bit of a selling out of um, former slaves, not necessarily an intentional one, but um, but there is a sort of, every once in a while, we human beings assume other human beings are going to be more reasonable than they really are. <laughs> and so there is a sense of, right, war's done, war's over, uh, they know there's no more slavery down there, um, so we can, we can like hand the reins back over. That happened far too rapidly. And uh, when it did, the protections that slaves had been able to gain from Union forces did, were not forthcoming from Southern state governments. Um, uh, there's one other thing that came to mind. Oh, a another motivation is demobilization. There's war weariness um, nationwide, north as well as south. And there is a huge push to get that army reduced down as fast as possible. And so the army goes from 2 million to about 275,000 within months. And when it does that, there's not boots on the ground, to use our phrase, in the same way. So there's not really government protection in the same way. There's the Freedmen's Bureau that does its best, but it's underfunded, it's understaffed, and um, all those things. Uh, how do families get reconstituted? The government's not involved in that at all, really. You know, who does that? And this would be interesting to hear, because I bet there are parallels here, too. Churches do that. Um, and black fraternal organizations do that. And one of the really like, heartstring-pulling things about the immediate post-war period is reading in African-American newspapers and even in just regular newspapers lists um, that former slave uh, lists of queries about my sister Lucy haven't seen her in 15 years last known to be in Texas has anyone seen her um, those lists get read from church pulpits uh, they get read in Freedmen's Bureau's office they get read in all kinds of public gatherings so there isn't a governmental presence really in the family reconstitution that's happening through other types of institutions churches being a big one and so that would actually be an interesting thing to hear you guys weigh in on there's not any there's no official, as I said, humanitarian organization. There's no such thing yet. So who steps into the gap? It tends to be churches during the war itself, church congregations, um, African-American churches, but also the Quakers are um, are very active in sending aid down uh, to the South. Um, there are some colleges, including my alma mater, Mount Holyoke College, sent a bunch of graduates down in a sort of Peace Corps uh, kind of guy. So there are individual responses during and after the war. This is related to your question because that continues after the war as well. Um, there individual and they're small and they are full of good intent um, and they do good there's no question about that but they are also a small drop in the bucket compared to the huge overwhelming need and so i'd love to hear your thoughts on the ratio between institutional apparatus and need today i feel like it was drop tidal waves then um, and i don't know if that's different now or not <laughs> 
Um, well, I'll just start from a, a, I think I mentioned earlier that we were actually born, the organization was born out of a church. So this was a group of uh, a church that uh, wanted to provide aid to the Burmese community. Um, but the founder thought, you know, churches can do good, but it, sometimes there's not enough um, infrastructure and support needed to really make um, long-term sustainable um, impact. And so, and um, we're, Rio Seven's Richmond is not a church organization um, at the time. Um, in Richmond, there was not, all the refugee organizations are church-based. And so we are um, specifically not a faith-based organization, knowing that a lot of refugees come to us from all different faiths. Um, so I just I would start there, but I know John could could talk a lot about um, uh, what um, supports that you all get from the government. Yeah, I mean, so uh, CWS and I think seven of the nine I mentioned that there were nine State Department approved um, resettlement agencies. I think seven of the nine are faith based, and most of them got started after World War II. And then, of course, got really busy after the Vietnam War, big refugee surge, refugee resettlement surge there. So, um, but in terms of the proportionality of what we're able to do collectively, uh, our institutional capacity compared to the need, I mean, um, even if we had resettled in the U.S. this year, 110,000 that President Obama had intended, um, that probably would have been, uh, you know, adding to all of the other resettlement from other countries all over the world, maybe 200,000 resettled people um, this year, and there are uh, six, about 65 million displaced people, uh, and that number, of that number, 22 million are refugees. The big difference between sort of the broader category and the narrower category of refugees is that some people, you can just kind of think of them as refugees who don't meet the technical definition because they fled, but they haven't crossed the border yet. To be a refugee, you have to cross the border. So there are really 65 million people in need, 22 or 3 million are refugees, and, and so uh, resettling 200,000 a year really is kind of a a drop in the in the bucket. Not that resettlement is the goal for all 22 million refugees at all. It's just that, um, you know, the options are you either go back to your home country, which is impossible uh, in the near term for almost everyone, uh, or you find a home in your host company, uh, host country where your camp is or where you where you fled to, which also is difficult or impossible for a lot of people. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I just think. Um, it is very difficult, and, and I guess it gets into broader topics of just what's generating all the refugees and displaced people, failed governments, and broader themes that I'm not all that qualified to talk about, but it's, um, you know, the driving forces are really strong, um, and it just seems to me that unless we can sort of change what some of those driving forces are that cause governments to collapse or for us to have serious of, of the world, um, you know, trying to deal with it on the back end is uh, pretty difficult. What would you say your organization's immediate needs? Uh, what ways that people can help? Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure Kate can speak to this as, as well. I mean, we, uh, we, we overlap nicely, I think. Um, you know, there's always a need for um, certain kinds of volunteers. Um, uh, so if you're available to transport people to appointments, there are a lot of appointments for new uh, um, arrivals. So that's really important. Anybody who has any interest in teaching English, um, you know, Kate and her organization do a lot of work with Afghan women she spoke of earlier, and I'll um, pass the mic down there. But, but you can imagine that um, it just it's a cultural thing, and the Afghan women in their own country tend not to be out and about as much, uh, not be out in the working world and so on, and education uh, has been denied in some years there, and so they aren't all that used to be, aren't all that anxious to get out in, into a very strange country where many of them don't speak English. Um, yeah, we always can use uh, donations. Um, we get several cars donated each year. 
um, but uh, you know, a car in good running condition that's uh, inspected means that somebody can take a job where they might not otherwise be able to, and usually transport other people to that same workplace. You know, I mean, cash is king. So if anybody wants to make a don donation to CWS or reestablish or or the other organizations, that's great. Um, uh, we uh, and and furniture, furniture in good condition, especially if you can sort of deliver it when we need it because we don't have a lot of storage. Um, and those are just off the top of my head, but uh, I'm sure Kate has some other ideas too. Yeah, I think. John, you covered most of the things. Um, because we're focused more um, in the later years of resettlement, um, we don't need things like furniture usually. Um, but certainly, if you have an interest in teaching English or um, helping people who have been here a little bit longer, maybe um, look and try to get a different job, as, as John said. Um, his organization works really hard to get people their kind of initial job to help pay the rent. Um, after a while, some people want to become, um, want a different job. Many of, especially with our Afghan community, uh, these um, folks ha are very highly educated, very highly skilled. Um, we're um, doctors and engineers and, um, and business people and um, have a lot to offer our community. Um, but unfortunately, because of how things work, they're starting from zero. They're not here on a work visa. And so um, that's really difficult. And so, um, so if you have an interest in um, providing employment opportunities or career mentorship, um, I think those are also areas um, that, uh, especially with the large number of Afghans who are highly skilled, um, I see that as a gap in Richmond. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, you, you had mentioned uh, the women who, who've been helping your family. What do you think is the most useful thing, most helpful things that they have done for you, like Kathy and uh, uh, Mary Virginia? And yeah, they uh, helped me for housing staff, and the most thing to help the uh, refugees teach them the American culture. How is the American culture? Yeah, because different mind. I told you before that it's different mind. Uh, they are completely different. The kids are different, so they have to learn how to, uh, how is life in the U.S. Uh, the, like back home Afghanistan, the, um, when the kids are uh, start playing, the first playing is fighting with each other. So yeah, it's fighting e with each other. Here is completely different. You cannot slave anybody, especially, yeah, kids. <laughs> but here, yeah, somebody has to teach him, like, uh, American culture, that see, this is not the truth, that you do this, do this. So this is the important things that somebody, like a volunteer, teach him English, yeah. Uh, like driving schools for them, uh, teach him driving, learning English, yeah. And on that note, we are out of time for our program tonight. So please, again, help me thank Dr. Chandra Manning, Kate Ayers, Abdul, I forgot your last name. Marzi, thank you. <laughs> and John Bauman, thank you so much. Please thank all of our wonderful partners. I also want to thank Alfonso Perez Acosta for bringing his wonderful art and his stories. He drew those portraits of Civil War refugees and people who worked in and around contraband camps, as well as having portraits of contemporary Latino immigrants to the Richmond community there and had some wonderful stories to share. So I encourage you to talk to him if you haven't already. Also, folks to thank our wonderful staff in the American Civil War Museum for all of your support making this event possible. And of course, Hunt and Williams for their sponsorship to help make this program possible.